All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another installment of City Lights Live. I'm your host, Peter Maravellis. And tonight we welcome back into the house Joyce Carol Oates after many moons and a pandemic long absence from our program. It is great to have her back with us. Her presence in the literary world needs little introduction as she has produced numerous celebrated works of fiction, poetry, and nonfiction. She is the recipient of numerous awards for her work. These include the National Book Award, a Pan America Lifetime Award, National Humanities Medal, and much more. Tonight, we are celebrating a unique work. It is called Joyce Carol Oates, Letters to a Biographer. And it is edited by Greg Johnson. And it's published by our friends over at Akashic Books in Brooklyn. As a graduate student, Greg Johnson began a correspondence with Joyce Carol Oates, which grew into a friendship that was the last to the present day. The book we're celebrating collects some of these letters stretching across four decades. They display a rich friendship between the two, highlighting Joyce Carol Oates' emotional warmth, her erudition, at her at times wicked sense of humor, and very importantly, her mastery of the lost art of letter writing. This is a magnificent collection which paints a picture of a friendship, but also a remarkable chronicle of a literary life where we cross paths with the names of such notables as this, John Updike, uh, Toni Morrison, Jacqueline Kennedy, amongst others. It's truly a fascinating and very compelling glimpse into Joyce Carol Oates's writing practice. So joining her tonight in conversation, we are delighted to have with us Steve Wasserman, the publisher of Heyday Books and a good friend of City Lights. Steve's involvement in the book trade and the literary world is, of course, legendary. Before we begin, as is customary, I would like to acknowledge that we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Ohlone peoples. Uh, many dialects were spoken along this peninsula. I would like to take this moment to offer our respect to those who have come before us as stewards of the land. So join us now in giving a warm welcome to Joyce Carol Oates and Steve Wasserman. It is great to have you both back with us. Welcome to City Lights. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. Well, I know time is of the essence, and uh, I think I'll just begin by saying I'm so thrilled and delighted and honored to uh, uh, be uh, Joyce's interlocutor for this conversation. And uh, I've read the book thoroughly. I've got all these little things here, uh, noting passages of the higher gossip and more that excited me to read. And I find that the only thing wrong with this book is that it's my friend Johnny Temple at Akashic Press who had the wit to publish it and not, hey, they, how come we didn't tumble to this thing? So uh, my admiration uh, is mixed with uh, some envy uh, here. And uh, really, the, the first question really is, how did this curious project come to happen i don't i can't recall and i look at the books behind me you know this is not uh, some virtual wallpaper i don't think i have a book on my shelves that is similar uh to this extraordinary collection of letters written over nearly half a century to a young man who starts out as a a uh, devoted reader of your work. You'd only been publishing by the time he writes his first letter for 14 years. Uh, um, many more books and plays and poems were to come, but he sort of falls in love with your work and then ultimately becomes your biographer, uh, keeps every uh, letter and postcard that you ever sent to him. And now, a half century later, he's now, what, about 71? You're a bit older. Uh, how did this project come to be? And what motivated both you and Greg Johnson to think that by putting these letters together, um, it would suggest something that would be of interest to others outside the two of you? Well, that's a very interesting question, Steve. It's such a sort of a mammoth question. You know, we don't really ask ourselves this, this is what I'm working on going to, going to be of interest to anybody else beside me and my my therapy animals, you know? So those are questions I think people in writing and publishing should not even ask. However, since you ask it, it was completely Greg's idea. I mean, I never thought for a glimmering of a second that any book like this would be possible. Greg Johnson knows my work very thoroughly and it, we were writing letters to each other for decades, but by which I mean letters, you know, in three dimensions, not email, letters, the kind where you used to type and then you would 
fold it and put it in an envelope and put a stamp on it and address it, which I think is maybe a completely mysterious and arcane practice today. Like nobody does that today. So most of these letters belong to another century, literally um, the century preceding this in which people were willing to spend lots of time writing letters. My own feeling in looking at these is one of vertigo. I can't imagine I had so much time to write these long letters, so much passion and so much enthusiasm. Today, my letters tend to be very brief. My email letters are probably the same is true with you. And when... And did Greg come to you with, as it were, a finished and cold selection of what is he estimates to be more than a thousand letters, uh, of which 236 are in this book? Did he present to you a kind of finished manuscript and then gave you the opportunity to read through them? Well, I'm not sure that's how it worked. Greg had also edited my journals or right. I should say journal some years ago, probably about, um, maybe about 15 years ago, he edited a really large journal uh, comprised of about 30 years of material that was in my archive. I actually couldn't really bring myself to read a lot of this material. It's very painful to read things that you've written years ago, you know, it's just very difficult. I don't want to sound coy or eccentric, but looking back into the past when my life was much, much different, my life was much happier. You know, I can op I open the book and I here's a letter. I'm talking about my parents. My parents had passed away, my father, 20 years ago. Um, I read about my husband, Ray, who passed away and, you know, it's very difficult to be a time traveler in matters of the heart. Well, you mentioned your parents. Your parents, um, uh, Frederick and Carolina, yes, uh, are evoked in this collection of letters in ways that are very intimate and uh, human to me. I did not, of course, have the pleasure of ever meeting them, but uh, clearly uh, Greg and your folks struck up, at least on the account of the letters themselves, uh, and from what you say, uh, a, 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 a certain friendship uh, or fondness that, uh, that they're, they're forever um, uh, t asking you to remember them to him and send him their regards. And over time, as they become, uh, as the various indignities of getting older begin to, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, they begin to grapple with those things. And you too, a very um, attractive, at least to my reading, portrait of these uh, encouraging and uh, devoted parents of yours. And uh, it's quite the opposite of the impression that one usually gets from not only from writers, but from almost everyone one meet, that somehow they're in a kind of rebellion against their parents. And that if their parents had anything to do with shaping the people they've tried to become, it's usually in, uh, in a kind of antagonism. But that does not seem to have been the case with you. And uh, could you, I wonder, maybe you should could speak about uh, that aspect of the letters. Well, my family is very important to me. And my father was um, a person who had to quit school when he was in eighth grade. Um, this was around the time of the Great Depression. And so my father would have gone on to be educated. He would possibly have been a, could have been a university professor, maybe. He loved books. When he, after he retired from being a factory worker for 40 years in Lockport, New York, he became an auditor in a um, university program for senior citizens at, at the university at Buffalo. Mm -hmm. So that he was, he was then about 65 
and onward. He lived to be in his 80s. But that was the happiest time in his life. So I always felt that my own life was just extremely fortunate because I came along later, later in history. I was able to be educated. I went to high school, the first person in my family among all the relatives to graduate from high school. And then I went on to university and now I'm a professor at Princeton. You know, It's sort of like a fairy tale Whereas my father was cheated of all that by just the vicissitudes of history. Mm. My, and my mother, too, was an intelligent person. She was not an intellectual. She did read. She read all my, they both read all my novels, all my books. But my father, particularly, I think, was a literary person. And it just didn't happen for him. Both my parents, uh, as I said, they lived through the Great Depression or they came of age. And their parents had very difficult lives, extremely difficult lives. So I just admire and respect them all enormously. I very often write about those earlier generations. One of the things that when Greg finally um, acquits himself of the of your biography, which I guess was published, I think in 1998, or was it earlier? Um, I would I wouldn't know. Okay, you wouldn't know, but but you write him uh, about the uh, the biography in ways that almost suggest that th its main value for you was his portrait of your uh, grandparents and the early years of your family, and when he evokes the uh, the the culture and and uh, environment in which they uh, sort of come of age and sort of set the scene and reveal to you uh, some aspects of worlds uh, not exactly suspected or known in much detail by you. And that is the part of the, 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 his biography of you that seems to compel uh, your own fascination. Oh, yes, definitely. Well, because Greg was sort of poking around in archives and history, in a way that I had not done, he discovered that my grandmother, my father's mother, was had been Jewish, which was a secret. I don't know that it was a very uh, carefully kept secret, but I didn't know about it. And so that was amazing. The whole Jewish side of my life that was completely uh, non-existent. Uh, my father didn't know about that either. Um, since then, I wrote a novel called The Grave Digger's Daughter mm -hmm. about this phenomenon of Jewish immigrants who chose not to acknowledge that they were Jews when they came to this country and just kind of went out into the Midwest or wherever, into the countryside, upstate New York, and uh, assimilated into the culture without having maybe any... Uh, religious identification at all. I think my grandmother used to say sort of vaguely that she was Protestant. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, a, it's almost the way that you wouldn't, you wouldn't say you were Protestant. You would say, I'm a Methodist or a Presbyterian or, I mean, that's not somehow an authentic way of speaking, but nobody thought anything about it at the time. Um, they just I, perhaps they had had enough of pogroms in Europe and anti-Semitism and just wanted to start afresh. Why anyone would go to upstate New York, north of Buffalo, I do not know, but they did. Yes. Well, famously, America is a one of its greatest conceits, as you know, is that uh, by coming to uh, the so-called New World, uh, it was a way of uh, ridding oneself of the suffocations of history and of proclaiming uh, a desire to reinvent yourself and uh, and uh, anew. Of course, uh, uh, it's uh, not really possible to escape history, uh, and it comes uh, back. But I'm I'm interested in the in the the whole way in which you and Greg Johnson become friends, and at some point. He declares he's gonna. He wants to write your biography. Were you ever troubled 
uh, or was he ever troubled? Because we don't have his letters. We only have your letters. Were you ever troubled that um, it might taint his biographical project? Were you to become as close friends as you seem to have uh, become over the course of these years, that that would somehow uh, either enfeeble or color uh, a certain unsentimental eye that a biographer presumably needs to have when they're trying to write about another's life? Well, that's another very interesting question, Steve. I would almost have to have, um, you know, a long time, an hour's discussion or so with you about what you mean by those various things. First of all, I don't think anybody can be without some perspective or some ideological bias or some predilection, whether it's acknowledged or conscious or completely unconscious. So, you know, if you like your subject, I mostly just write about things that I like to write about. I wouldn't attempt a biography, let's say a Robert Frost, and, and end up hating him. You know, I just wouldn't uh, begin such an enterprise. It makes sense that people write biographies of about others whom they do like and respect. So I probably gave it literally no thought at all. You write uh, in one of your letters to him in 1993, uh, uh, pushing back against some of those who have a coarse and reductive view of the biographer's art, like uh, the late Carolyn Heilbrunn, who uh, regarded uh, all biographies as fictions. And you uh, uh, make a stern objection to this, citing such uh, wonderful biographers as Richard Ellman, the biographer of, among others, Oscar Wilde uh, and James Joyce and other notable people. And you write that your own theory, and here I quote about biography, as a genre is that we read it fascinated to know how someone else has quote done it gotten successfully or even unsuccessfully through a life there is always a mystery in others lives one hopes the biographer can illuminate what was the mystery in your life that you thought felt that greg johnson illuminated in his biography that was prior to his book unknown or unsuspected by people well, I have no idea about that. I guess we just assume that there must be something about us that we don't know. I mean, there's a whole penumbra of unconscious uh, motives and different kinds of dispositions I think we all have. So I was probably just suggesting that. But you have to remember when you read letters that people have written, the letters are written to a person. So it's like a conversation. And if I were writing to someone else, I would probably possibly say something different. I don't really believe that there is a fixed personality. Uh, William James says we have as many personalities as there are people whom we know. So my relationship with Greg is expressed in these letters. This is the way I talk to him, right. but it's not necessarily the way I would be talking to somebody else. Well, and of course, Whitman so famously cracked that we contain multitudes. Uh, so uh, I suppose one way those multitudes can be explored uh, is in uh, the work of uh, the novel, which uh, you have uh, been devoted to, as well as the plays. Actually, one of the things that I thought was interesting in these letters was the, uh, the, the amount of time spent in discussing your playwriting, I think is... Uh, there's more time spent discussing plays than the novels. Uh, I may have got that balance a little wrong, but I think I'm kind of right. Um, and I wanted to uh, just ask you, on the basis of these letters, um, the plays have been a very important part of what you've, uh, the work that you've done. And I wonder if you could talk for a little bit about the, the, the ways, what the form of the play affords with, that, with respect to the exploration of character or, or human dilemma or predicament that you find um, particularly attractive or compelling in a way that the novel doesn't? Well, I did, it, I did the forms more or less simultaneously, so I wasn't choosing one over the other. Okay. I had an invitation in, sometime in 19, 
90 from the the um, director at the um, I'm sort of blanking out now um, a, 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 was a theater for new plays and I was invited as a as a person who was not a playwright to uh, to write a play I think there were a number of, of maybe novelists who were invited and so I wrote some one act plays. I was experimenting. It was because of this invitation. Now, would I have done it without the invitation? No, I would not have thought of writing a play. It was only because somebody invited me to. And uh, I found it very fascinating. I love to experiment. Probably the early plays that I did were actually short stories or mm -hmm. monologues. I mean, in fact, they were. I probably wrote them as short stories first, and then I adapted them as plays, which is not difficult to do if you're writing a dialogue-driven short story that's fairly short with maybe two, two characters, two or three characters. So it was always experimental. Now, the most profound difference between the genres, of course, is one is very solitary and obsessive, and you're doing a lot of revising. This is writing fiction, you know, sitting in your de at your desk alone, writing over and over again, and just sort of immersed in another world. In contrast, the theater is enormously collaborative, and it's very public in the sense that you're working with other people, you're constantly revising because of the um, actor's expressions, um, how the language is sounding. The first thing many playwrights see is that the play is too long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the obvious thing is like it's too long, you have to cut it back. The actors are going to bring silence to the role and pauses and things with their hands, mannerisms, their bodies, their faces. The actors are artists and they're gonna be good doing their artistic expression using your words sort of as material. So it's even more true with with movies. You know, the, the writer who provides the dialogue is just providing the, the material and then the actors and the director make a work of art out of it so yeah. that that was very exciting to be working with other people mm -hmm. and it's it's very social i don't know if you've written a play you've been involved in theater but you would be a good actor well at one, thank you at one time i actually auditioned for the american conservatory theater and uh was accepted in 1968 into their program. But because my parents didn't have the $500 for the tuition for the course, uh, we did not uh, accept. And uh, so I was uh, consigned to uh, plays that a very good theater department at Berkeley High School mounted in the late 60s. Uh, and uh, But theater was, a, was an early... Uh, love. Uh, so yes, I was always drawn to to acting. At one point in the book, you remark about how you're in discussion with Jean Moreau and uh, Marty Scorsese uh, about doing a screenplay uh, based on one of your books, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Jean Moreau project was going to be, um, it was going to involve her being the director. She wasn't going to be acting in it. Uh -huh. She wanted to direct for Mer Merchant and Ivory was supposedly going to produce this. Merchant, Ivory, and John Moreau were involved. And she liked the novel of mine called Solstice very much. She had read it very carefully and she really, really liked it and wanted to direct it. And so there was an option and I wrote a screenplay and John, ca John came here to Princeton and she worked with me we did we were we were working together morning after morning in my house and then we went to look for locations on the delaware river she was so glamorous and so charismatic and so french yes that everybody just was stunned by her 
she would come into a restaurant or in a room and everybody's staring at her. People in semi-rural New Jersey and, and Pennsylvania who actually didn't know who she was, right. nonetheless, when they looked at her, they sort of knew that this is a special person. So she was sort of sashaying around in, in Princeton. All my friends wanted to meet her. Everyone wanted to sit at the table with her. It was sort of getting to be a mad scramble <laughs> at one point. But she was also somewhat difficult to work with. In what sense? Her, well, um, along with being charismatic and beautiful, she had a very strong will, as you can imagine, she would. So she knew very well that I that I had an agent and that I belonged to the writers' union. So if you belong to an agent, you, I mean, if you belong to the writers' union, you have an agent. You don't just keep revising your script over and over again for no extra money. Right. She was having me change things every day. And then at one point, I remember she said with this beautiful smile, she says, I think we should set this in Maine. You know, it had been set in Bucks County. And it was like that, you know, it was sort of like a, a situation comedy where I was a straight man. And I was, I was sort of rewriting the script continuously. She would come in every morning with new ideas. Finally, even Joyce sort of gave up and I contacted my agent and I said, I love her, but she's completely exhausted me. She's eviscerated me. I'm completely beaten down. So the agent found out about this and he just, uh, he talked to her and she said to me, she said, I don't know how you put up with me so long. <laughs> so after that, uh, it was more of a, a professional relationship and I did complete the screenplay, but then Merchant Ivory couldn't get the money for it. They had had a couple of failures. We think of Merchant and Ivory being very successful with the remains of the day and um, a, a room with a view, these very famous movies. But they had several movies that didn't do well at the box office. Unfortunately, that was around this time. And I think they were sort of ending their their run of, of success. So the movie was never made, All, but it was a wonderful experience for me. I learned that you cannot come up against a grand dame, <laughs> and the men, and the men, my my friends, my men, my men friends here, were all dazzled by her, and they would, you know, they always wanted to see her. <laughs> anyway, she finally went home, so that was quite an experience. It's interesting to to think that you were attracted by the nature of collaboration, when the work, of, in contrast to novel writing or poems, um, you know, solitude is the prerequisite for realizing ambition. Uh, one almost thinks that many writers are rather something of uh, the sort of misanthropic, uh, but, um, you know, movies uh, is a, are a heartbreak because the trouble in the world is so, what once was so famously said, is other people and you need other people. Uh, I remember there was a uh, documentary of Orson Welles uh, some years back that PBS put on and, and it ended in such a heartbreaking manner. The camera is on him. He's in a studio against a sort of white backdrop as if he's being photographed by Richard Avedon and his interlocutor has clearly asked him, although you can't hear it, uh, has asked him, um, when you look back on your life, um, what's the verdict? And he looks into the camera and he says, without a trace of irony, he says, oh, when I think of the novels I could have written <laughs> alone at my typewriter, the plays, the poems, the this and that, why, oh, why, he intones, did I have to fall in love with movies? Ooh. You need bankers and you need others. So many good ideas never, never accomplished. And he said, no, my life is a failure. 
Oh, he didn't say that. Did yes, he? he he goes to a very dark place. Orson uh, Welles said that. Orson Welles, the the boy prodigy, uh, the creator of Citizen Kane at the age of twenty four. You know, maybe uh, he was just being kind of perverse. No, you I know, don't think so. I came to know him a little bit toward the very end of his life. I published the last piece he ever wrote at my uh, request. It was a uh, a kind of uh, obituary for Jean Renoir, who had died in Beverly Hills, and the L.A. Times and its uh, majesty had failed to note the death. And I thought it was an outrage, and I had reached out to him. He kept a regular table at a fashionable restaurant called Ma Maison and agreed uh, to write this piece for me. I think it was one of the few deadlines he ever kept. Well, that may be true, but people have a way of dramatizing themselves too. And Orson Welles created great works. Of, I mean, Citizen Kane, for instance, his Macbeth, of chime, is it Chimes at Midnight? Yes, Chimes at Midnight. And some other work, you know, The War of the Worlds, radio pro program. I mean, he did so many things, so. One of the charming things in that vein about these letters is, of course, people live their lives forward and not backward. And so one of the joys of reading these letters is that uh, you don't know from letter to letter or from year to year what life is going to uh, bring you and how things are going to turn out. So the reader vicariously gets to accompany you as quite literally the surprise of every day and the joy of the work that you're trying to do is the oxygen that infuses so many of these sentences. Well, that's certainly true. Uh, it's like keeping a journal or a diary. Yeah. When you're writing every day and you literally don't know what the next day will bring or even if there's going to be another, another next day. So it's very different from writing a novel or a short story where everything is sort of uh, in control and you do a lot of revision. There are different ways of living. Um, we have some time left before we open it up to questions. And I sort of want to just touch on a few notes uh, that just jumped out at me. And I can't help but uh, seize on something that was is probably, I'm probably committing a heresy by even uh, making this observation, particularly in a, in a forum that's sponsored by City Lights, for whom the cult of the beats is so essential. Uh, but you have a letter in which I was personally delighted to see you characterize uh, your reading of Jack Kerouac, uh, which you confess you had never read him till actually quite late uh, as, as an adult. And then you have a kind of throwaway characterization where you say, and his fellow beats Allen Ginsberg, and then you write, and the sinister William Burroughs. Oh. Tell me about the degree to which you find him or found him sinister. Well, I may not even have read him. It was probably something that was sort of in, you know, an aura, seeing photographs of him and hearing that he had sort of accidentally killed his wife and so forth. I think it was more just his reputation than anything literal. But looking, you know, looking at life in a kind of retrospective way, we're all sort of trying to do what we're doing, you know. We sort of do it, we're doing what we're doing, and William Burroughs wound up being William Burroughs. Kerouac was Kerouac, and Ginsburg was Ginsburg. You know, ultimately, you sort of do what you were born to do, and it doesn't behoove other people to be critical. I never met William Burroughs or any of those people. Well, you could take another position on that. You could say you're, that your uh, judgments were untainted by any actual familiarity with the person at hand. That would give you a perch of unsentimentality that would perhaps embolden judgment rather than constrain it, no? Well, I think I came to appreciate some of Kerouac much later when I looked at some of his work, but I, w I was um, maybe ideologically opposed to the idea of, of writing a, in a kind of a spontaneous way and not revising. I've always revised tirelessly or obsessively. Now I think I probably revise about 98% of, of my writing time. So I didn't I didn't like that idea or I didn't think it was a sincere or honest or helpful idea to tell like young writers 
first thought, best thought. I think Allen Ginsberg said that. First thought, best thought. Well, I think the first thought is important. You have to have a first thought, but then the second, third, fourth, and fifth thought very likely are better, you know? Yes, and well, so I, I completely agree with you, but now we have a whole technology which, uh, which uh, uh, gives a kind of... Um, confers a certain nobility on, on first thought as best thought. The internet uh, and the sheer velocity of thought uh, squeezes out the space, the solitude required to have the second or third thought, which actually might uh, approach something called wisdom. You uh, write in one of your letters that, uh, uh, and, and earlier, you characterize yourself as sort of stuck and you don't use the word as a, a term of uh, opprobrium. You say, I'm kind of still that 14-year-old girl. I still have the mentality of a 14-year-old, by which I take it you mean, you mean to say or suggest something of the avidity, of the curiosity of someone who's discovering the world uh, fr freshly and trying to make sense of it. Later, you write that the only, quote, real element is the powerful, heady, seductive spell of nostalgia, which I see to be a truly American quality, the narcissism of perennial adolescence. The letters are chock-a-block with such intriguing uh, notions, which uh, arouse in at least the reader or this reader um, wanting to know more. Talk to me a little bit about what you regard as the narcissism of perennial adolescence, which you seem to suggest is at the heart of a good deal of what could be called American life. Well, I don't know that narcissism is a, the uh, inevitable word. It was probably something that came to my mind. Well, I, I think of adolescence as a time of great uh, excitement and curiosity and uh, learning. And I don't think of it as a pejorative um, some of our greatest writers in American literature had what I would call a very uh, positive adolescent perspective. Henry David Thoreau, for instance, uh, it's just brimming with a kind of skepticism of adults, distrust of the establishment, a feeling that he wanted to be his own person. Uh, the very essence of nonconformity, going his own way, preferring his own company, being very funny. Henry David Thoreau is very irreverent. They all tended to be secular and anti-religious uh, re conventions. And I think Emily Dickinson too. She was always a, she always had the always had the perspective of a girl, a kind of tough adolescent girl. She wasn't maternal or she wasn't somebody who wanted to have a lot of babies or take care of a man or any of the conventional maternal um, feminine roles. She, um, she did take care of a lot of people who were ill because that's what you did in the 19th century. If you were a woman in a household, you, you took care of many dying people. But she also was a nonconformist in terms of religion. She mentions the word God once in a while, but she was by no means uh, a Christian in the usual sense of the word. She was extremely, I think, a kind of wonderful adolescent girl. I would have, I would have identified with the young Emily Dickinson, and and there are other examples of writers like that. Maybe even maybe even Hemingway, though he enjoyed being called Papa. He always had this kind of bravado in the sense of being an outsider and being contemptuous of conformity. But one of the reasons that I identify with being 14, it's probably more like 13, that was a time in my life when I spent a lot of time alone. Unlike adults today, my parents allowed me to take the Greyhound bus. I I traveled all alone when I was maybe 12, 12, 13, and 14. I took a Greyhound bus into Lockport, New York with, a, with mostly adults. 
I went to school in the city and I did a lot of walking around all alone. Before that time in my life, I would be in a car with my parents, like your mother's driving or your father's driving. You're kind of under the control and the oversight of your parents. But then when you're a, an adolescent at some point, you may strike out literally on your own. I was even having lunch in restaurants all alone. I did things that young adolescents or children today would never do. So it was a different era. I spent a lot of time walking around Lockport where the Erie Barge Canal comes through. There's very wide bridges. There's a railroad trestle, a pedestrian bridge. I just did a lot of walking and looking around and spending so much time alone. So I think I came into my own personality around the age 13 and 14. I was very happy. I liked being alone. I liked walking along lanes and looking at houses and wondering who was living in them. And my school life was almost another world where there were more adults, of course, teachers. So I think I really grew up at about that point. At the same time, I never went, I never went beyond that. When I go into a library today, like a, like a small library or any library, I never want to look where my books are. I want to come into the library and look around where I, remembering when I was a child and the books were so exciting. And it was such a world, almost like a great cathedral of all these unopened treasures. And I wanted to sort of go into that world and start reading all these books. But in, in no way in this fantasy is there any room for my own books on a shelf because that destroys the fantasy of all the of what lies ahead, if that makes any sense. Sure, so. of, course, of course it does. <laughs> um, are there any of your books that are currently uh, being banned in this or that uh, community or state? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really know about that. I mean, maybe if somebody told me. I think they're not banned as much as other people's books because they're not read as much. Uh -huh. If anybody really read <laughs> almost <laughs> any of my novels, they would be banned. Like Blonde would be banned and lots of the short stories. But I think maybe it's not an issue. Okay. You... Uh... Um, in 1998, you add a postscriptum to one of your letters to Greg Johnson, which I about fell off my chair. Uh, you write, I was just now invited by Playboy to, quote, have a conversation in their pages with Donald Trump. I can't even think, you write, of a, quote, witty rejoinder. What do you think possessed them to think that you should be Donald Trump's interlocutor in 1998. 1998. Yeah. You know, I, I saw that letter too when I was looking through the letters. And by the by the way, I have not reread all these letters. It's too much. But I noticed that. I totally forgotten. I have no idea. Okay. That's good. Now I have to uh it it's it's my obligation to point out what seems like a contradiction. And uh, at the risk of of maybe introducing a uh, offensive note, um, uh, because one of the charms of letters is that you can unburden yourself of disobliging comments by others because you're not in a public forum and you're in a much more intimate setting. Yet, of course, now that these letters are being made public, one has to wrestle with some contradictions. At one point early on, you uh, uh, characterize Tom Wolfe's Bonfire of the Vanities by saying, Tom Wolfe's rather racist and sophomoric bonfire of the vanities. Then later, much later in 1999, when his A Man in Full is published, you find yourself on a panel, I think at the Miami Book Fair, and Jamaica Kincaid, another writer, is on the uh, panel, and she takes the opportunity to condemn A Man in Full as uh, not only a bad novel, but she calls Wolf, according to your letter to Greg Johnson, a racist 
before an audience of perhaps 300 people. And you write that you thought doing so was reprehensible, even though you had not, you confess, read A Man in Full. So I wondered, how do you square that sentiment that you have with respect to Jamaica Kincaid and the earlier characterization of Wolf's in uh, Bonfire of the Vanities as rather racist, and why take objection to her full-throated denunciation? Well, looking back on it, I I have no particular awareness or you know memory of any of this really. I do remember Jamaica Kincaid being a little bit mischievous and naughty. No question. That is Jamaica all over. <laughs> yes. He said that Tom Wolf he wore white because it was like the Ku Klux Klan, <laughs> which I thought was funny. Well, I don't think we should call one another racist. I didn't know Tom Wolf, and I probably didn't even read much of the novel. You know, when you're writing things in letters, you you do exaggerate, but it's not nice to call people racist. Probably Tom Wolf was about as liberal as one could be in his little circle. I mean, I have no idea. I think he was very conservative socially. Like, I think he was very critical or pejorative about feminism. Today, he would be very ironic about woke, wokeism. He wouldn't like that. And he was extremely famously very derisive, very nasty, about Leonard Bernstein and Bernstein's wife when they were uh, doing some fundraisers for the Black Panthers. Oh, sure. He he, he wrote the uh, or sort of notorious piece for New York Magazine, which became, uh, you know, yeah. radical uh, radicalism. And, radical radical uh, sheep. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. We, you know, when you look at all that now, you can sort of see, well, maybe there's something there. But on the other hand, wasn't it really very wonderful and generous of the Bernsteins to be having these fundraisers? I mean, after all, look at the history of the treatment of Black people in America. You know, come to come down with so much sarcasm on the heads of people who are trying to do something good and, you know, make reparation in some way, to make fun of them <laughs> you know, it sort of takes your breath away. It is very nasty of him to have done. Still, I wouldn't, I wouldn't stand in front of an audience and call somebody a racist. It just seems that we don't need to call one another names. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, I have my own criticisms of Tom Wolfe. This is not the, uh, uh, and not not least is that we once encountered each other. I, I was wearing a white suit. I went back to my old dentist at 65th and Park. I, I sat I sat down in the waiting room. I happened to look up and across the way there was Wolf in his white suit. And he <laughs> looked at me and said very drolly, and do we share the same dry cleaner? <laughs> um, uh, we had met some years before I was working at Farrah Strauss and Drew when um, Bonfire of the Vanities was published. But to defend his his literary project, I, as I recall it, he uh, one of the impetuses that he had for writing Bonfire of the Vanities and and exploring in novels uh, what he had been at pains to uh, achieve in his journalism was his, he had a whole critique of many American novelists uh, that they that the novels had become small in ambition. And he wanted to go back to a more Dickensian uh, exploration of the predicament of people and of class. And I always thought that amb that ambition, a worthy ambition, simply meant that he hadn't read as widely as he needed to read, because if he had only read many of your books, he would have included that this ambition was being spectacularly fulfilled by one of our great writers who lived across the river from him. He would never have said that because I don't think he would have wanted to read a, a woman writer. I think women writers would not have been on his, his radar. But he could have read Norman Mailer. I mean, Mailer was certainly trying always these very ambitious sociological, you know, political novels all the time. Bill Styron, yes. John Updike, John Cheever in a different way. You know. I mean, it's just that I don't know why we're on the subject of Tom Wolfe. I really don't know much about him. 
satire is a kind of double-edged sword. You know, you think you're cutting other people and eviscerating them, but actually you're you're cutting your own fingers. You have another, for me, the best sentence or one of the best sentences in these letters is a characterization of uh, John Updike, who you had uh, something of a relationship back and forth, seeing each other from time to time. Uh, but the late John Updike, I don't mean late as in dead, I mean late as he aged and kept, kept working. Um, you write that a, a lot of the writing for you of Updike came across as self-preening, rather fussy, without any subject apart from his own pleasure and what he does. And then you write, imperishably in my opinion, John sounded like a man who has spent his lifetime constructing highly detailed miniature ships inside bottles. Well, I wouldn't say that now. I think that was not fair. Um, no, I think, I think John Updike's early short stories are just brilliant. I teach them all the time. I didn't, I'm not a great admirer of the rabbit novels, the long novels. Mm -hmm. Maybe I was thinking about that. But, you know, it's really not, it's it's not good for writers to be passing judgment on, on other writers. Well, I'm happy, to... I'm happy you didn't uh, cleave to that principle when you were writing these letters in so unabashed a way to Greg Johnson, because then they would have been, you would have sanitized your own prejudices and instantaneous reactions, and they'd be a lot less fun to read. Well, that's very true. And, it, it, and writers do all sorts of different things. I mean, John Updike did have some poetry that was extremely yes. light and, and maybe trivial, but he also has beautiful poems. Yeah, the it's last true. that last volume of poems that he wrote while he was sick, I think were surpassingly moving. Very beautiful, very beautiful. And I think we should look upon what is most uh, valuable in one another, you know, to look at the good novels, the better novels, and, and just ignore the other work that, that we don't like as well that's my that's my attitude now but when so, when I wrote some of these letters I was very young I mean as much younger you know you're firing off a letter to a friend you want to be funny you want to be witty have no idea that 40 years later the letter is going to be talked about and something called zoom and I mean computers didn't exist then you know you can't foretell the future Let's uh, go to questions because we have a, a question uh, uh, who has uh, is uh, uh, making an objection that the interlocutor, i.e. me, he asks, is the interlocutor running a filibuster? I am not running a filibuster. Uh, so let's open it up to some questions and uh, that would be great. And I think Peter Maravellis is going to uh, indeed be the traffic cop here. So uh, I'm going to work backwards. Uh, Elizabeth asks, how does it feel to have your life so completely documented in these letters, but also in journals, emails, maybe even tweets? Well, that's a, that's a question very difficult to answer. I don't really identify much with the life. It's sort of like fleeting images on a screen. You know, the screen, the, the images are moving very fleetingly and very quickly, and then they're gone. Like, when I look at this book and look through the letters, I can sort of remember the time that they were written, but a lot of it is completely uh, a little bit surprising to me. I, you know, I, I, I can't allow myself to start reading it. As I said before, it's like time travel. I'm catapulted back into the past and I've, I've lost so much. The person I am now, in March 2024 is so bereft compared to the person I was, you know, with a, with parents, with my husband, you know, a sort of a different, a complete world that's gone now. So it's very hard to look back. I think maybe the documentation is more of a, an idea than any kind of reality. Nancy asks, did you know that your books had been banned in prisons? And what do you think of that? Banned in prisons? This is according to uh, Penn. Oh, well, I didn't know that. I, I, maybe they're banned on death row. They don't want to give a death row inmate the wrong ideas or something. Um, I don't know where that would be. Prisons are all different. 
the prisons in the California system are quite different from Georgia. Um, prisons in Michigan and New York State are different from Texas. I think they're all depends on the ward in each, in each prison. Yeah. Uh, let's see. There's one from... One from James. Do you consider yourself a quote unquote Jewish writer, whether you do or not? What is your feeling about the uh, ongoing assault on Gaza having taught at Princeton the battles at many universities over what people can and can't say or do about the ongoing assault? Oh gosh, that's a very complicated question. Um, I, I, I wouldn't consider myself a Jewish writer. I'm not Jewish. My second husband, Charlie Gross, was Jewish, and so that definitely made me Jewish-ish. There's a <laughs> like, category, like if you're around Jewish people long enough, you become Jewish-ish. You know, some of their uh, intense interest in politics and sort of contentiousness in, in, a, in a positive way, bookishness, reverence for the book, um, culture, always quarreling about is about Israel. I never knew before I met Charlie that there were so many different points of view on any subject that people could argue passionately. Um, the people whom I knew through Charlie, who were Jewish intellectuals, could not agree on anything. I mean, they, they would be disagreeing about a restaurant. There was just so much so many, so much contention. So having a coherent or even uh, even clear idea about a situation so complicated as Gaza, I can't imagine how they would be impassioned and discussing it. But it would be very um, emotional. So I have no way of getting into that. What I what I was interested in about the Jewish aspect of my own life is that so many people said that I looked like, I did look like my grandmother who turned out to be Jewish. Then when people saw the photograph of me, they said, well, you look Jewish, you're Jewish, you know? But when I looked at it and when anybody else looked at it before this, nobody said that. So there's something about these, uh, you know, the predilections that we have, those expectations or confirmation bias as it's called. I always loved books, and I always wanted to be, go to, into libraries and just had a, a real desire to read a lot and to write. And people say that's very, very definitely a feature of being Jewish, but I'm sure other nationalities as well. So the question, I think, is a little bit loaded. It's, it's a little difficult to answer in, a, in an objective way. Uh Let's see. Mark asks, could it possibly be time for a sequel to your delightfully disturbing novel, Zombie? No, not by me. <laughs> no. And oh, 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 no. Why would I, why would I do that? Why would I do that? Zombie, the character would be about how old would he be? You know, you can't be a, a sex pervert, serial killer, murderer, you know, when you're like 90 years old. I think he was probably, he'd be retired by now. He was based partly on Jeffrey Dahmer, partly on uh, John Gacy. Yeah. And partly on, oh, what's his name? The most famous of all the- Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy, how could I forget? Ted Bundy. It was sort of based on all of those serial killers and then some imagination, of course. But that's all over. Somebody else can write a sequel. You're welcome to it. Uh, Victoria uh, mentions, I recently rewatched Smooth Talk. Do you have a favorite of the film adaptation of this work? Of uh, smooth talk. Yeah. 
Well, there is really only one smooth talk. Uh, Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been? is the title of the short story. There have been quite a few short features based on that story, and some of them by students, film school, uh, like graduate school film uh, students, and some of them are really excellent. They're very, very good. I haven't looked at them in a while, but if you type in where are you going, where have you been, with quotation marks around it, you can probably watch videos by graduates film school. Students then are really excellent. I'm so impressed with them all. Of course, Laura Dern was made her uh, film debut, I think, in Smooth Talk, or maybe it was the first movie she'd been a star. She was the lead. And Treat Williams is in it. It's really delightful, really quite wonderful. It's not my short story, really. It's it's uh, The short story is like the basis for the film, but the film has much more in it than the short story. The film is a feature film. It's much longer than a, a short story would be. There are a lot of scenes with mo the mother and daughter and scenes in the shopping center. Just a, a bit, sort of a beautiful movie. I think um, it was... It was thought that the movie was really about a mother and a daughter, or a daughter and a mother, the movie, whereas the short story is Connie's more alone, and she confronts a, a, she confronts a figure out of mythology whose death, some people think he might be the devil, but he's certainly some sort of enigmatic or even quasi-mystical pop phenomenon, cultural phantom, not necessarily realistic. Uh, Natalie asks, are there any books that you regret writing? That I regret writing? No. Why would he even think about that? I mean, why would anybody look back over his life? It's not that important. Say you wrote a short story when you were 29 that you don't like. Doesn't matter. Nobody's read it anyway. <laughs> it's not doing any harm in the world. It's not like dropping a bomb somewhere, you know, where it does irrevocable damage to anybody. Most books don't even get read. Even books that are bestsellers decades ago, they're just in library shelves now. Nobody's reading them. So I, I I was not really worth being upset over. I like that echoes an observation you make in the letters, which I thought was very important to make and is too little ever made, which is that you basically ask at one point, where did this notion arise that a writer's work has to be even uh, and that it's some kind of crime to be so-called uneven uh, in, in all of this? And uh, uh, you, you contrast that to, yes, yes, there was Mozart, Life ended very uh, abruptly and early at age, what, 36 or something, and and he was a genius. But uh, the idea that every uh, work uh, of an artist, whether painter, sculptor, writer, has to be even in some way or to reach a certain thing is a very skewed metric. And uh, I thought that was important. Well, that's for, I mean, it's very self-evident. Yes. So I don't believe expect anything else. I mean, Shakespeare wrote the greatest plays in the English language, but he also wrote some plays that are not so great. I mean, Titus Andronicus does, is not really a very good play. Um, the, the sonnets are brilliant, but they're not all brilliant. There are poems of Robert Frost that are not as good as his best poems. I mean, everybody knows that. I don't think that's... Uh, in a way even worth talking about, it's so obvious. Well, we find ourselves at the top of the hour. Steve, are there any parting thoughts perhaps? Uh, no, just that um, if you're coming for the first time to work by Joyce Carol Oates and you're entering her uh, uh, the shelf of books that she doesn't wanna look at and you happen for reasons wholly mysterious to pluck this latest book off, it is a wonderful and personal and engagingly intimate uh, window into the quotidian life and the daily pleasures 
of a writer who's inventing herself and sharing it with someone who's become a fast, devoted, and engaged friend. You'll be, it's a delight. Thank you so much. Well, thank you both for a delightful evening. Ms. Joyce Carol Oates, congratulations on this very, very lovely collection and such a pleasure having you grace our virtual hall. Steve, thank you for doing the honors tonight. Thank uh, you, and I have to just make one sing, sing out. I discovered that I myself am mentioned in one of these letters in 1998. I was astonished uh, that I fell ooh. off my chair where oh. Joyce uh, says, by the way, I just got a call from the Los Angeles Times uh, inviting me to write about two books on boxing the, 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 from someone named Steve Wasserman, who's the editor of the LA Times Book Review, and I have never written for the LA Times, and the new format is very exciting, and I thought I would unearth and share with your readers. This oh was to cover in wow. March of 1998, uh, and thank you, Joyce, for one of the highlights of my tenure as the editor of the book review for contributing so marvelous a nearly 2000 word essay review of two books, which we were very privileged to put on the front page. What was what were the books? That I forget. <laughs> I'm to... so glad I didn't say something terrible. Actually, oh. actually, I do remember what one of the books was. It was that big, oversized, enormous book on Muhammad Ali. Valley, yeah, yeah, yeah. And which Tashin did not want to part with to send to you as a review copy, but I finally got them to do so. And I believe that was, um, as you as you rightly observed, the LA Times pays the usual pittance about the same as the New York Times book review, but they gave me all this space and I'm going for it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. <laughs>